In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. indeed found no proscenium the voice of everything immersive i'm your host noah nelson and welcome to episode 384 this week on the show something monumental is coming to las vegas this april it's being billed as the largest touring immersive art experience in the world and it's kicking off with a residency at resorts world the newest casino on the strip the show is Transfix, and it will cover four acres, bringing over 50 large-scale immersive art pieces to the very heart of Vegas. We sat down this week with Heather Gallagher, director of tour strategy at Transfix, who not that long ago was the long-serving head of technology for Burning Man. But first, a couple of quick updates. This week on the site, you'll find our latest review rundown and an updated call sheet that has all kinds of goodies in it. And next week, we'll have a preview of the upcoming Without Walls Festival in San Diego. In fact, while you're listening to this, uh, I might just be at the press preview. Uh, and our team's impressions of Intercon U and more. Plus, the pre-sale for the Next Stage Immersive Summit coming this June 2nd through 4th is on sale right now. It's on right now. In fact, this weekend is the end of the pre-sale because on Monday, badges become available to all. And we've got some more exciting speaker and guest announcements lined up for next week while we're at it. Those who had badges to the 2020 and 2022 events, this weekend is your best chance to lock down your badge before the floodgates open. If you're looking for a bit of help coming, the scholarship and subsidized badge application is also open and we will be through March 31st. 20 scholarships and 20 subsidized badges will be awarded. If you or someone you know fits the bill, please take advantage of the link in the show notes. We want to see those applications coming in. Now, before we get to the Patreon update, and it's a pretty good one, I want to talk to you about what our friends over at the Black Immersive Creators Grant are doing right now. And what they're doing is they're accepting applications through the end of April. The grant is now open. The grant is open to US, U.S. based black artists interested in creating immersive work. And the recipient will be given $10,000. Check the show notes for the link. That's another one that's really good to share out in the world. I want to see people sharing the link to the Black Immersive Creators Grant. I want to see people sharing the link uh, to the uh, subsidies and scholarships. Uh, let's get some students and some young creators into the summit and mixing and mingling with our veterans uh, and uh, some of the, the captains of industry types that we're going to have in there. All right. So go do some good. Spread the good word. Now, speaking of good word, I promised you some on the Patreon front just like 30 seconds ago. We stand, as of this recording, just $25 shy of our $3,000 a month goal. Remember, this whole thing is because it's getting more expensive to do this. In fact, uh, the tool we use to record just started charging us money this week for the first time ever. It's like, what? In the middle of recording. And literally, I, I went to record this episode, this interview with Heather, and found... Uh, Found a button where they're like, pay us now uh, after eight years of using it. Um, hey, I'm happy to pay them. It's a good tool. Uh, I wish I'd gotten more notice, <laughs> but still. Uh, so the, the price of doing business is going up for everybody. We know it's really rough out there, but we are just $25 a month shy. Uh, if we don't hit it, we're going to put the newsletter behind a paywall. And you know, I don't really want to do that. So we've just got about six $5 backers, once Patreon takes their cut, away from doing this thing. And we got like nine days to do it as I'm recording this, like seven days to do it as you're listening. So or thereabouts. Um, really seven? God, I gotta look at a calendar. What's going on this month? All right. <laughs> Here are the folks who brought us this close. With this close. Here's who brought us this close this week. Jacqueline Adorni, Greg Borand, Courtney Ozaki, Meyer Draws, Blake Hodges, coat of Wild Heart Ranch, Ceciliana Trevino, Ryan Dennison, Justin Fix, 
Jessica Schoolman, Ben Enos, and AB. Thank you all. We are very close. One more big backer, six $5 backers, a whole swarm of $2 backers. Uh, that's what's going to take to get us over. And uh, I sure hope we do it because I don't want to have to do all the work involved in putting the newsletter behind a paywall. It would be such a pain, such a pain. Uh, okay. I also want to thank those who have upped their pledges. Wynne Thorne, Anthony Robinson, and Diana Williams. Remember, as little as $2 a month at page... I said that just like all those. Those are some of like the most best people like in our community. I just want to point out real quick, right? Like Wynne, who's been with us forever. Anthony, who has worked with us over the years and is like a dear friend. Diana Williams, who's on our board. All of them jumping in. So I'm, I'm reading things and looking at stuff, but I, I want to be clear right? Y'all make this thing possible. All right. As little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash no proscenium guarantees your access to the newsletter. It lets you into our discord. More on that at the end of the show. It doesn't involve a helicopter, right? I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, and keeps making all of our coverage possible. If you're already a backer, drop a review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice and share the articles you find useful on your social media platform of choice. It helps immensely the articles the call sheet the review rundown the links we send out when they're out there to help people please 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 uh we're only as good as our farthest reach and you are a part of that as always big thanks to our sustaining backers samuel mystery chris woolman samantha davison eric shamlin elaine daryl jay bushman jerome joseph gentes tom leonetti mcguire win thorne ryan David Bassick, Richard Ayers, Lonnie Hanson, Lecker LeCool, the Ministry of Peculiarities, and Jan Budman. We're also on the lookout for community partners who are up for working out special deals for our backers. Hit me up at noah at noprosinium.com for details. That was a whole lot. A whole lot. Let's get into the show. This April, a four-acre labyrinth of over 50 interactive, kinetic, illuminated, and fire-breathing artworks from artists around the globe will launch at Resorts World in Las Vegas, kicking off what is being billed as the world's largest touring immersive art experience. The event is Transfix, and joining us on the cast today is Heather Gallagher, Director of Tour Strategy at Transfix, who also has the distinction of being the head of technology for Burning Man for the better part of two decades. Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for asking me to join you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, like this this flew through the feed, and like the second I saw it, I was like, oh my God, we got to talk about this. And you said yes, and I was like, well, that was that was easy. I wish everything was easy. Um, I gave sort of like the capsule version, right? I, I pulled a lot of that from like the marketing copy. But how do you describe Transfix? Well, the good news is I've been describing it for a couple of years as we've been raising money and, and, and launching this, this crazy show. Um, so I'm happy to describe it. I mean, the capsule version, right, is that it's a monumental immersive art experience. So it's going to be a timed entry kind of situation where you come through and there's, we can call it a labyrinth, but it's not like a maze where, you know, around every corner there's a trap door and you're going to get lost. It's more, it's more like a, a, a giant space that you can meander around and around every corner. You'll discover a new vista or a new piece of art or maybe a hidden speakeasy. So you're going on a journey and encountering either monumental or innovative or fire breathing art or pieces that are all of those combined. And having a great, hopefully, a couple of hours engaging with this art. You know, a lot of this art is things that can be interacted with. You can push buttons. Maybe you have to do things with your body or just the sheer vista of being in front of a 50-foot tall giant lady whose breathing is blowing your mind. And hopefully, we're kind of bringing people out of themselves and into this bigger tapestry and introducing them to this kind of art that a lot of people on the planet have not had. So you know, that that's the, the textbook version of it. You're going, going around a maze and exploring and interacting with art. But truly what we are doing is birthing a whole new creative ecosystem. This style of art 
as you and I were talking about a few moments ago, um, before everyone else joined us, it's really only been experienced by a relatively small audience of people, right? Yeah. Um, some of this art has been shown at a place like Burning Man or Coachella, a couple of public art installations, maybe EDC. But let's face it, most of humanity either doesn't want to go camping at some festival or they can't get tickets or they're just not into the techno party scene uh, or, or whatever else. And so the, these artists work very hard. They make these amazing artworks. People have seen images of their work, but they don't know the story behind it. They don't know the artist's names. They don't know the beautiful community benefits, you know, and, and people who've come together to make these projects. And they, they don't really, most of the general public doesn't get a chance to sort of play with them. And yeah. so what we're doing is, is making it possible for a wider audience of humans to get a taste of some of this art. And we're also making it possible for the artists to get, wait for it, a bit of regular recurring income, possibly whoa, for the first whoa, time in a very a long time. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 an angel gets their wings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right? So usually this Seriously. artwork is st stored in somebody's warehouse, right? They're often paying money to keep it. If they're lucky, they get, you know, a weekend gig to schlep it down to something like a EDC. And then they're babysitting their artwork at a rave they don't really want to be at. I mean, maybe some of them don't mind being there some of the time, but you get the point, right? Yeah. Um, or they're, they're struggling through trying to get a public art installation, and that's very few and far between, or grants. And sometimes, you know, living very, very, very modestly while they've made these amazing pieces of art and it's costing them money. So we said, let's initially start by, you know, first of all, we've got database of thousands of pieces of art around the world and then relationships with hundreds of artists. And we said to make this thing go and to do it quickly, let's see who's got what in inventory and that can, you know, can we could make road worthy and let's curate that into an experience and let's take it on the road and show it to people. But so then we, later, we, as we get more money, let's pay the artists to make new stuff. And that's you know, then it becomes this thriving thing, right? So it seems like a little art tour, but it's really a whole new movement, we hope. Well, I, want, I, want, I totally want to get into like the aspects of it being a movement <laughs> of paying the artists, but let's start with that point of it, you know, getting it on the road. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of those moments, you know, I, I showed this to one of my colleagues and he was like, why didn't we think of this? Like, why didn't someone do this before? Like get they do a big show and get it on the road. And I'm wondering what was, the, what was that tipping point? What was the thing that said, let's do this? Was this something maybe you've always been thinking about or, or did maybe did, did, did the pandemic pause have something to do with it? Like suddenly people aren't, you know, in the normal mode and, and everyone had a moment to stop and think and ask Wait, why? Why do we do things the way we do? I mean, yes, yes, and yes. I mean, this okay. is the, this idea or something like it has been in the sort of subconscious of certain communities, and it's come up many a times around you know many a campfire or whatever when somebody's like, "What if you know we could take the take the art or do something with the art and take it on the road." Um, and 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 some people have maybe attempted some some similar, maybe smaller scale projects. Um, but what happened, and I cannot take the credit for it, is uh, two, two gentlemen I knew out of New York who were experiential marketers, who were experiential marketers. Um, I was reaching out and trying to figure out my next passion project, because that's the only way I knew how to roll. And they said, we've been chewing on this idea during our pandemic pause. And had you know done some work with arts and brand before, and had said, you know, let's, what can we do with some of this art? Like we've been so inspired and had seen at Burning Man. And they ran the idea by, by me because um, it, when you're doing a commercial enterprise with art that at least some of the art that has been shown in a decommodified uh, environment like Burning Man, it's a very nuanced stage to take something from what's really a non-commercial environment and just get edge it right into that edge of commercial that is hopefully a tasteful win for everybody. And so, you know, they said, what do you think of this idea and help us do it right? And I said, 
I think this is a great idea. And the only thing, you know, is, is it crazy? Yes. The only thing crazier is if you try to do it without me, because these are my friends for 20 years. <laughs> and I'm steeped in the, the way of the Burning Man culture and community. I'm like, I'm the human embodiment of those values. And so what a poetic next step to do some things for my friends and to help being a part of bringing a new opportunity to these kind of artists. So it was a pandemic pause. It was a couple of guys who were crazy enough. They did um, bring in some rock and roll touring uh, friends and production friends and said, help, help us kick the tires on this financially, right? And so some very early models were done uh, for the couple of months before I joined them. I'm kind of like the stepmother of the project, right? So they're, they're the birth daddies, but then I joined just after viability was determined. And uh, they brought in some rock and roll guys and who do a lot of the number crunching for rock and roll tours and said, could we make, could we make this work? You know, could we make this work? And if you do the, uh, the renting the pieces of art, uh, at least initially, and you don't have to sink millions and millions and millions of dollars in real estate and development and building property, and you take a show on the road and, and leverage a lot of the same know-how that you would for rock and roll tours, well, lo and behold, it turns out you can wiggle out a pretty uh, reasonable model there. And hopefully that one where everybody wins. That is, that is definitely exciting. Cause I, if, I gotta wonder like, you know, the arrival of Meow Wolf with their locations with house of eternal turn and then popping up in Vegas and popping up in Denver and, and their continued expansion. Did that also help sort of show that there is a, like a market beyond the decommercialized spaces and beyond the the festivals for people going to you know going to experiential art going into places where they are surrounded by the art and and not just you know a gallery a museum or oh that's cool my friends were at you know electric forest and i got to see all the pictures mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, Meow Wolf was definitely one of our reference points to helping people understand the concept and able to say, well, look how well this is doing. And gee, you know, and it's common knowledge if you do the research, as, as I've done, their, their center in, in uh, Denver costs like $95 million to build Bespoke. And we were talking to investors going, we don't need that much. <laughs> In fact, we need a very, very small amount of that to get our show on the road. But the, this other, you know, these other things are are blowing up and are very popular, as well as the kind of more Instagram, you know, kind of museums there where people are really, really just there taking selfies of themselves. And that's that's lovely. That's lovely if that's what uh, what you're aiming for. But we're definitely reaching for something that's going to kind of disrupt the art world, right? Like this, this art doesn't fit literally or metaphorically or or spiritually into the traditional gallery museum models right like it's art meant to be experienced it's not art that's made to be sold and bought by somebody and hung on their wall or sequestered away in their villa um it, it just it doesn't fit into the economies of those systems and so we said you know this is an opportunity to really democratize people's access to this kind of art as well as bring this art into a into a, a much broader human awareness and acceptance at the same time. The other project that um, was really relevant was all the kind of Van Gogh experiences, right? Mm. The immersive Van Gogh, the immersive Frida, the immersive, I mean, you know, just add on a, a master after immersive. There was six different touring versions of the immersive Van Gogh. It was confusing. Sometimes two opened up in like the same city. There was literally mm -hmm. two going on at the same time in New York City, yep. um, like rip off after rip off after rip off. Millions and millions and millions of tickets sold to these things. We would go in, you know, we I'd go to all this stuff, right? I go to all of it, and we you go in and you're like, okay, some of them are better than others, fair, okay. But a lot of times you go in and there's a giant warehouse size room with projections on the walls, and if you're lucky, on the floor, and people were gobbling it up and we said look how many people are buying tickets to this thing just imagine what it was like what it would be like if we really turned the volume up on this and blew people's minds we're talking about four acres 
50 pieces and and that's a lot in the 50 pieces a lot and it feels like 50 pieces a lot to put into four acres and i'm wondering as you're approaching the flow of how people enter how people explore how people experience you know at burning man you've got this huge territory for people to to kind of wander about and go and at at the music festivals the the art can be like sequestered or you know in certain spots away from the stages sort of it's like a, a pullback relief era this it's the main attraction and it's constrained uh, what's been your approach to sort of create a a, a a pathway through is, or is this going to be sort of, there's four entrances and people can kind of go wherever they want. Labyrinth, Labyrinth implies to me that there's, there's a, there's a pathway design to all this. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And initially before we got the residency in Vegas, which effectively doubled the footprint size that we were planning to tour with, um, we were definitely a little bit more worried about throughput. Like, you know, you know, it's, it's such an art to get people to keep moving just enough, mm-hmm. right? So that they're kind of doing the scroll through and they're getting to, to, to have all their moments, but that they're not kind of clogging up the, the passageways and that there, there's a healthy flow so you can continue to put, you know, humans through it. And when, you're, when you have a smaller space, um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's an art and a science to that. Um, as we doubled in size and the, the, the Vegas opportunity came up, it went from that concern to, oh, gosh, OK, well, double the footprint. I guess we need to really double, maybe not entirely double, but we're going to need more art and we're going to need more everything. And now we're going to go really big and make a splash on this thing. And then when we tour, we'll, we'll tour with a subset, you know, because it's just impractical to tour with with um, that much, you know, we'll kind of take the best of, or we'll trim down a bunch of the other uh, elements. There's one piece that's very much appropriate for Vegas, but not necessarily something that, that we can take all around the country with us. So, mm. so in turn, so we became less concerned with getting people out as quickly. So that m- let us liberate the design a little bit. You still have, you know, so now there's several different paths that people can meander and none of them will be right or wrong. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's it's a complete choose your own adventure story, sort of like you would see at Meow Wolf, where you can kind of run in every direction and you're having a completely different journey. But I'd say there's convergent points and divergent points, and there'll be moments where you sort of are drawn towards certain things. Um, when you start the experience, and every good experience designer will know this one, of course, you need to take people from whence they came and bring them into the into the current moment, right? Bring them into this new experience. So of course we're we're using our favorite tool, the portal, <laughs> uh, and uh, bringing people into a, a long 120 foot giant metal tube, for lack of a better description, tunnel, where um, there'll be a, you know there'll be kind of a there'll be herded into that they'll kind of pile up and gather if you will herd it's probably not the right word and <laughs> a light show a light show will unfold on on top of them for four and a half or five minutes right so you kind of come in you get your blinky light brainwash <laughs> and you're kind of in a little holding pen and then that's over and now you get released into into the journey and there will be, there's a couple natural twists and turns when you come out, when you just see things and you start to explore. And each space has, a, you know, the art pieces have sort of different textures and different, um, different materiality and different emotions that you want to evoke. That's how we map out where the art goes. Besides, there's just practicalities in some of the cases that de- depict where everything goes. I mean, what a phenomenal puzzle, right? You've got a lot of factors to consider. We're not necessarily trying to tell a narrative story, but we're definitely taking people on a journey with highs and lows and excitement and calm and quiet and kind of different palate tasters and cleansers and exciting moments and more contemplative moments. So we're trying to make sure we're, we're kind of touching people in all their special places as they go along. So maybe by the other end, you know, in addition to have had a great time, maybe they're a little, little tired, you know, like yeah. maybe they've been on like a journey and, and they're kind of ex- excited about what they got to do. 
let's, I want to explore this, this idea of like taking people on a journey without it being narrative based. Um, Cause I think and sometimes all too often and at heart, I'm a story guy, but like, I think all too often we like turn to narrative and story structure as sort of the, the delivery mechanism for meaning. And, and mm-hmm. maybe you could talk a little bit to, to the idea of like, all right, it's, it's not an, it's not narrative. We're not telling story. They're not following characters. It's not dramatic, but there's still a, a journey here. There's, there's a curation. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's your, what's your approach to like putting these things together? You know, we, we went back and forth about how important is it to have a narrative or not. And some of our advisors are, you know, are literally, you know, very famous storytellers. Right. And so oh, you got to have a narrative. And I was like, look, the last thing we want to do is create some sort of slightly goofy character, you know, that you're following around the bouncing, bouncing weasel in the desert. And he's got a nickname and then you have to buy a stuffed version at the end. Right. Um, <laughs> or okay, whatever. So you're there's two, there's a stuffed ways. weasel character that you're going to be following. OK, I got it. All right. You know. uh, <laughs> no, fixie, but, the but transfix yeah. weasel. Got it. All right. No, he rides a fixie yeah. bike. You know, no, like, here no we go. Like, were harmed. <laughs> No, no, no weasels were harmed or curated into the experience. Um, so we, we went back and forth where, um, you know, it was, it was, so let's say for, you know, phase one, because we're pulling together pieces that are out there in inventory and doing it in a relatively short time frame and really proving the concept, it's really about giving people the, the dynamic experiences, right? It's really about I mean, the overarching experience is let's pull these people out of themselves. Let's have, let them have some of the transformative moments and experience that we have had with this style of art. And let's let's really kind of surprise and inspire them and and get them to just step into bigger and bolder versions of themselves. And if there's a whole we could do a whole other podcast about about the transformative power of of art, especially this monumental art. And then it's it's definitely about how do you weave them together, right? Is if one space is a bit more organic in nature, is it now you want to make sure you're transitioning into something else that's nearby that makes sense? Mm. And then another piece and another, and then you're like, where's my figurehead piece? Okay, the the one that you know everybody's going to want to hang out with and sit down. Okay, you put that further in so that everybody doesn't just come in and sit down like 13 feet into the door, right? <laughs> you want to kind of get them in and keep them moving. So it's a combination of feels and functionality, truly. And that you also, okay, in the middle is going to be the spectacular light show. Um, it's called Axion by an artist named Christopher Bowder. It's only been seen in Saudi Arabia, 40 by 40. I don't remember how many light fixtures. But it is, it's a spectacular light display. It's kind of better than the Bellagio uh, fountains, if you will. Um, and so that's obviously a climactic experience. And it will be run a couple of times throughout the night because it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the encore or the real pinnacle moment of it. So that's at the heart of the experience. And you can come into it from a bunch of different angles and catch different pieces of the show. But meanwhile, you're kind of weaving through all these different experiences around it. But we're not, you know, with the with the pinnacle experience, it's not going off all the time. You you got to kind of show up and where, when you see something happening or you'll know throughout, you know, a couple of times throughout the night that it's going to happen. And that becomes a gathering and a shared memory space where everybody gets to see this thing happening and it kind of blowing people's mind. And that, you know, and then it's kind of near. There's definitely the ways to get out and to get food and beverage and to go to the gift shop and everything is that so that you're hopefully you know hopefully that's one of the last things that you engaged with even if you see it a couple different times and then you're really going out on just this like you know you're really pumped up at that point so it's more you know there's a lot of strategy involved in 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 the the place making and the what are people tasting and what do they have options to do as they're doing this exploration when we compact it down to a smaller footprint for touring we'll we'll get a little bit further into the Okay, and we had to clock. Okay, how long is somebody likely to spend with this piece? Right, it's easy if you've got them in a tunnel and there's a four and a half minute light show. You just calculate it. Then, then you have to kind of map with each each piece. Does it have a 
seven minute play span where you've got people running up and down and pushing buttons or, or doing something with it? Are they going to queue to wait to do a thing? Um, or is it just something people might go and sit down and hang out with for a while? So you really kind of do the best you can to figure out what somebody's journey could look like and make sure you're you're able to fe- meet their needs. But you're also, you know, after a couple of hours, they're probably going to be ready to go. <laughs> um, one thing I will say is I spoke earlier about, um, you know, that right now we're starting with pieces. People have an inventory, mostly, not 100 percent, but mostly. But as we start to get um, able to produce more shows, so we say we're like the Cirque du Soleil of visual arts, right? Instead of acrobats, our art is the star, are the stars, and our artists are the stars. And um, you know, and then we'll be touring like that with lots of different shows. So once we get the concept, once we get everything up and running, and kind of the the wheels in motion for real, we'll be able to put money back towards these artists and, and or any of the hundreds in our database. And we'll be able to get bespoke pieces created, at which point we can start getting into more kind of genres or themes or maybe certain narratives because we'll have we'll been able to sort of grow pieces with the artists that are feeding towards a common message. But we didn't we didn't want to do that for this first round because it would have been prohibitive to get get the show on the road. But you are you are looking ahead and you're thinking like that Cirque Mile is really interesting because you you know, particularly because of Las Vegas being where you're you're kicking off, because of course there are Cirque shows that we all know tour all around, so often for years, and then there's those residencies mm-hmm. they have again often for years, uh, and and the the business model particularly of the circus is interesting because each of the performers owns their act, and so mm-hmm. if, if if one of them gets injured or, or pulls out. For whatever reason, they have to refactor the run of the show because, like, well, we lost the net act tonight because you know he twisted his ankle, and that mm-hmm. that performer might be so. Uh, you don't necessarily have the same thing with installation art, luckily, but but there is yeah. there is something to the model there of like, oh, well, you know, things can come in and out, and it doesn't necessarily destabilize the entire experience. Yeah, and we don't have to feed 150 people three meals a day and house them in a city for this is real. This is this yeah. is p- part of the way. I mean, yes, we'll have a, a group that tours with it that are, you know, literally, literally some of my dear friends are out there right now in, in a big dirt patch installing giant sculptures. And there are some people who have done this for decades in various environments and for events and who the artists trust and who have to have working knowledge because these they, they, they're not just Legos, right? These things do not just snap together. It's a 50 foot giant metal lady, right? There's there, you have to have the right kind of finesse and exceptionally skilled and careful, heavy equipment operating and rigging capabilities. Those people are going to be on the tour and setting up and maintaining and taking down, you know, the stars, the, the precious babies that, that are the art installations. Um, but otherwise it's a, it's a bit of a lighter load move around <laughs> instead of all the people that come with a circus when we talk we talk about the ecosystem that you're looking to build there's there's the ecosystem for the artists and there are there's also this ecosystem for the running crew and for the technicians and and maybe you could talk a little bit about what that what this dynamic might mean you know across the spectrum of the kind of folks who've been the ones to build Burning Man over the years, who who are or are tapped to install at the festivals, that you've got this other outlet for all of this uh, feels like a pretty significant play. You know, it, it is, and it's important to know that you know, okay, Burning Man is its own ent- its own creature, right? And there's it's it's a private event, but it's on public land. Uh, the ins- you know the, the the insurance is around certain elements of the, uh, the event, but people literally when they buy a ticket, they say that they are you know they're assuming the risk of their own death by going, and uh, not to get morose about it, but there's some containers around that that mean that you don't necessarily have the building inspector all up in your business. You know what it is? You know what I mean? And it's not that anybody's being intentionally reckless, but there is risk to that kind of thing. When you're touring something like this and you're setting up, say, 
in the front yard of uh, um, a huge, you know, uh, casino on the Las Vegas Strip that has, you know, they, they literally Resorts World is is the most expensive resort ever built on in Las Vegas, and the most recent one built since 2010. And they, you know, they are not going to lose their gambling license over this. So that means there's insurance and documents and inspections and processes all the way down. You know, that there's a Hindu saying or a, that it's a turtles all the way down. And I said, oh, no, it's lawyers and turtles all the way down. <laughs> so that, you know, and we've, we've got our rock and roll touring production friends and some experienced marketer friends and Burning Man friends. And somehow we're trying to swirl together all these cultures and working styles and expertise into something that we can feed to the much more constrained environment that is doing things in the general public that's not on a festival grounds for a weekend. If you're setting up for several months, there's there's things around that. When you're moving into different locations, if you end up doing these things on parkland, um, it comes with it a very rigorous container that not everybody who maybe has done some of the festival weekend installs is going to be comfortable with, right? So it, it, we're kind of pushing some new boundaries on here. Not that anybody's ever been doing anything unsafely, but right. there is a lot more, there's a lot more in, at play right now and a lot more, that, a lot less tolerance for risk. That's something that, you know, in the indie immersive scene, we've been very conscious of here on the West Coast, you know, in LA, you know, you go back to 2016, there was the the ghost ship fire in Oakland. Mm. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, a lot of people lost their lives, you know, people people, friends of friends lost their lives uh, for, for me. And it also created this incredible chilling effect over just trying to do anything on the West Coast, even if all you were trying to do was, you know, get six actors into a house with like, you know, 20 people running around the house. Suddenly you couldn't pull a permit for that anymore. And mm-hmm. it's, it, it, there's, there's so much and sometimes it makes a lot of sense. Like right? there, there are times you get these close calls, you get these moments where you're like, "Oh man," and then there are other times when it feels completely illogical. Um, like how how much has to go into uh, the the bureaucratic part of it, but it also mm-hmm. sort of tips it towards having to go to these really large scale, you know, uh, events like something that is bringing the the knowledge and the background and the insurance connections of rock and roll touring, uh, because they're, you know, they deal with giant trellises that are, you know, put into over the heads of a bunch of audio. I've had, I've had, you know, Bono on a mechanical arm, like over my head, you know, like if something had been built wrong, it would have been disastrous and they, they, they make Mm -hmm. it go each time. So I don't think that's good. That, that wasn't going over the question. That was a comment. I'm sorry. I, it's just, it just always, <laughs> it's this weird thing that always kind of drives me a, li- a little bit nuts because we could have so much more, but then you also know, well, we got to do it right. And, and we don't want to scare, we don't want to scare all these big institutions away from letting us have our play dates. Um, and so yeah. it, it's, it's, we, we, it's, you know, I went to the people that I had worked with previously who insure, insure Burning Man because I was like, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> they got insurance for when I was at Burning Man. Well, who else is going to? And I had sent some other people their way to, with festivals or people who, you know, were kind of up, up in the jam. So I knew that they were already going to be friends and fans of the work and they were going to get it. Um, and and they, they did. Uh, they did. And um, and so they've literally been socializing with you know, with the underwriters for a couple of years while we were fundraising and kind of getting people comfortable with the model. And, you know, because when you got like fire breathing art, I mean, let's just let's just recognize that the rest of the world doesn't necessarily be like, oh, sure, I'll I'll just ensure your event, you know, when your stuff's on fire. Um, so fortunately, I brought in um, professionals in that space who who already they got it they got it and are are like the super cool insurance people um but yeah you don't you don't you want you don't want to mess it up because then you mess it up for everybody and it's such an it's such an important thing to take out into the world i'll tell you what i mean the, the 
the burners on our crew are having to figure out some of the ways of the other other staff and the rock and roll guys are like, oh, this is new and exciting. And then and then they get into it and they're like, what is going on? You know, going on here because it's it's a new it's a growth area for them too. You know, they were like, "Yay, we don't have to move to a new town every two days and set up yet another stadium show." But they're still up to their butt, you know, up to their butts and alligators, right? I mean, it's it's a it's a new space for them. So everybody's kind of doing something new together, and and we're definitely picking one of the more challenging intro entrance paths, which is going big in Vegas. So. Pray for me. Pray for us. If you, if you, Come well, to the show. There. Tell all your friends. <laughs> oh yeah. If you can make it there, you can be well, it's 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 in so many ways it's a perfect place for it. Like the second I heard that you were in Vegas, the second I heard you were at Resorts World, I mean, I've I've stayed at Resorts World and I was I was kind of amazed that there wasn't something cool like this next door when I did. And you know, granted I only stayed like a year, you know, into their into their run. But I was mm-hmm. sort of like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Um, and you perfectly, really good rooms, you know, like just very big, very big place, uh, lots, lots of space. Uh, good restaurant, big giant, yeah, good, good yeah, food. Good, oh yeah, definitely, definitely good food. Oh yeah, uh, there's a for everyone, if any if you stay at Resorts World, part of it, uh, there's a, a cool little boozy ice cream uh, spot in there. Uh, you can you can hunt it down. <laughs> uh, that was that was my treat uh, while I was while I was uh, staying at Resorts World. Um, but this this idea that you're gonna have this 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 incredible, you know, setup right there at the foot of it, uh, you know, you on that property, in the heart of the strip, in so many ways, is just it, it couldn't be more perfect. Um, and I, I got to feel. Well, like I think Santa, <laughs> <laughs> because. Uh... I mean, as, as they opened during the pandemic, right? And as yeah. the, the very, very large investment, um, like $4 billion, I think, to build the, the facility so far. And then they knew they needed to do some activations. And so they did a bunch of ground improvements on the lot that was it's part of their property, but they hadn't yet developed. And um, they did some um, improvements for a holiday light spectacular, the very called Enchant, the very first on the strip holiday light show, you know, with 100 foot fall tall trees and giant reindeer. And I've been through it several times, as you might imagine, in the fall, or in, right around the holidays. And so they did that to open that experience. And we connected with them, uh, like as that was a, being planned and about to go up. And, and we weren't even planning to go to Vegas for a number of years for various reasons. And uh, and then a couple knocked on the doors of some of my friends and a couple other people knocked on a couple other doors. And the next thing you know, several different venues in Vegas were like, well, why don't you come here and you can do it mm. for six months and then you don't have to start touring right away. And because that's costly and also hard and complicated, you know, to get up and running and you can kind of bake the show a little bit. And we were like, OK, Vegas, here we come. <laughs> So it was an opportunity, you know, it was just an opportune moment in time when somebody, a couple of different groups had some resources and we had some content to make use of their resources and and a team that had produced, you know, festivals, concerts, literally, literally our, our site and logistics directors to toward some of the biggest names on the planet, 139 tractor trailers in motion, setting up back to back stadium tours around the world. Right. So we showed up and we were like, we got a lot to get together here, but but between all of us, we, we mostly know what to do most of the time. <laughs> you don't get that opportunity if you're kind of just a DIY group who shows up with a couple of wrenches in their buckets, you know. Oh no, you don't. <laughs> Heather, this is this is all so exciting. Um the Cordites for people who want to come out who are curious, who are now got their got their eyes and ears perked up. Um, when we know where resorts world, but, but when does it start? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, how, how long do they have to check out this uh, initial launch run? So we are opening to the public on April 21st. Um, and we, by the way, it's predominantly an evening experience. So get your naps in that day. We are currently saying we'll be there through September, though, you know, as behind the scenes, there's always the, will we make it that long or will we get extended for various reasons? So I always say come early and come often. 
<laughs> because because if you if you don't have, show up early, there might not be a later. <laughs> very hopefully very there will true. be. I, yeah. I I got a good feeling about this, so I'm I, I won't be too worried. But yes, it's true. If you're curious, you should go on the early side because uh, it only means mm-hmm. there's more chance that it'll stay around. So yeah, we might change we might change some things up over time. Make it worth coming back a couple of times for certain. Not too bad. Heather Gallagher, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us all about Transfix and for going deep on the origin with us today. Absolutely. My pleasure, Noah. Thanks for having me. Once again, I want to thank Heather Gallagher for being our guest on the show today. Check the show notes for more about Transfix, how to get tickets, um, look at the videos. This, this is really exciting. I I can't wait. I, I'm really hoping I can get out there and check it out. Like a lot of you know, like there's elder care stuff I do here in town now um, that's part of the mix. And so I'm not as mobile uh, as I was before, but not for not me. Like I'm. I'm, I'm not the one doing elder care. I'm, well, I'm not the one being elder cared. I'm doing the elder care. So anyway, I'm going to find a way to get out there. Troy, I may need to crash on your couch. Just be warned. Um, I hope you heard that. <laughs> I hope you'd let me. Anyway, um, <laughs> everybody pressure Troy heard a majestic rep. No one needs a couch. Uh, okay. So, um, <laughs> I'll be in Vegas later this year, uh, checking it out. Let's see what is up. Um, there was a John wick activation going on in LA this week. I'm actually going there tonight as I'm recording this on, on Wednesday night. Uh, as I mentioned before the press preview for without walls festival headed down, uh, to San Diego, uh, to check out and also talk to some of the folks at La Jolla Playhouse. Uh, this is this has been set up with the support of the La Jolla Playhouse. I want to call that out, you know, making sure we always like to call out when, you know, we have, you know, support or possible conflicts of interest. Like they they are helping us do this junket trip, um, which uh, and, and also we're, we're working on some stuff behind the scenes, maybe trying to trying to do some fun things with them over the long haul. Uh, and so, yes, I will be writing up a preview, uh, but I won't be doing any reviews of wow this year. Although I think I'm going to, I'm going to head down and check out a couple of shows and there's some, there's some good stuff like already, already as of the press preview going up and just from what we know, what's already been said and what we've got, uh, what we've seen in the call sheet, we know that of course, Optica Moderna has La Lucha. That's going to be at, I believe, the Contemporary Museum of Art in San Diego. Uh, that's a co-production happening there. Optica Moderna, of course, is uh, David Israel Reynoso's company. They did uh, Las Quinceaneras and uh, Waking La Llorona, some of our favorite pieces. I think I talked to them last week because David's coming to Summit. So a new piece from them. And then uh, Brass Roots District, we know from casting listings, looks like they're going to pop up. Uh, Fair Play, which is from Unique Trapman O'Brien and Jessica Crean, also put a casting listing up. Uh, uh, you can find those in the call sheet. And so um, I don't think Embargo is broken on those because they're they're out there casting. Uh, but those are, those are three shows that are going to be down there. And uh, all from creators uh, who we know and love and whose work we've recommended, Brassroots we've recommended, uh, Fair Play uh, we've recommended. So go check out WOW this year. It's it's really shaping up to be a very solid year, uh, and they're going to be based out of the, uh, the Symphony Band Shell. So a very musically minded uh, WOW here uh, in the year 2023. What else is up? Uh, obviously, you know, I'm getting hyped for the next stage. Uh, I had a very good conversation with uh, some folks who've been on the podcast before, and uh, they're going to come and talk, and we're really excited to tell you about that next week. Um, there's some other folks who we were talking to that we haven't closed it down yet, and so I don't want to jinx anything, but it would be really cool. I'll say that much. Uh, I, th- I think it's going to happen. It's just, you know, 
corporations get involved and then there's lots of talking and things happen and that's the nature of the business um but it's really shaping up uh the folks who are buying badges already like it's it's already a great cross section and just bringing the community together is so great um, speaking of the community and being together and staying in touch um you know we've op operated our discord um which was sort of the sequel to our slack our slack was very popular and then um Slack was just getting, oh, I mean, Slack's got a different kind of setup. It's not built for communities, or at least wasn't at the time. I don't think it's, I still don't think it is. Um, and so we we migrated over to Discord and had an, kind of an open door policy over there. And for the most part, that was okay. For the most part. But I was, I was out of the movies last week. Um, I got the A-list pass so I can go see movies on the cheap. Uh, <laughs> I feel, why do I, why is it like guilty? I mean, look, it, it's kind of like working at a movie theater, but you don't have to clean up anything. You just like pay them $25 and like a month and then they just, you get to go see movies less if you're an employee. So I kind of like it. Um, and so I was out watching cocaine bear of all things. And when I got done, uh, with it, I had a text from Catherine saying that like something weird is going on in the discord and indeed something weird was. And from what we can tell, what I could tell from the logs, what I could tell from the behavior is it is a little like someone was kind of doing almost like a wrestling promo thing, uh, and kind of like creating a little scene and just, just not I don't life is short life is too short and we ban that person and we also are no longer keeping the open door policy if someone came through the open door policy and uh, that's done if you already had access to the discord um, if you are uh, what we call a, a legacy member of the discord um, you will not lose access. If you are a Patreon subscriber, uh, you also, you, you, you get access. So if you join the Patreon, you also get access to the discord. There are a couple of different roles, different levels, uh, that you might get access through, uh, the folks who are on, um, and friends of the show, like the folks who are the sustaining backer level, right? They uh, actually get the ability to invite people in. So we're just, we're changing, we're trying some stuff out, changing the rules. Uh, we've opened up like a professional section and I'm kind of like IDing folks who, who belong in there, you know, who are making work and like we know they're making work. Um, they're not just saying they're making work. Uh, and we're, we're working on having the Discord maybe live up to what it could be because I gotta tell you, um, th there were some folks who we've now, you know, r removed from the Discord who kind of, they just, they bummed me out a little bit. So I wasn't always using the Discord as much as I wanted to be, as much as I dreamed of it, as much as I had once used the Slack. And that gets to change now. So uh, it's members only. If you're already in, don't worry, we didn't kick you. You do want to make sure that you get your legacy role if you're in the Discord. I haven't checked in in a while. Uh, and then uh, if you want to join the Discord, uh, become a Patreon backer. And that's how you do it. Um, you get access that way. You got to link your Patreon to your Discord. Um, but if you use both things, then, you know, just uh, you can find... Um, um, I guess I should put a link in the show notes. There's a thing. There's a link in the show notes. Uh, I'll put it up in the Patreon as well. I'll put, uh, here's how to do it in the Patreon. Uh, there's some links there uh, at Patreon. I just said Patreon way too many times. The word starts to become meaningless. I just say it so much. All right. That's enough housekeeping. That's enough bookkeeping. Um, I'm... I'm just happy that we get to keep on doing this. We get to keep on making this for you. Um, that's why I wake up in the morning and why I don't go to sleep at night. Uh <laughs> All right. There's been way too much me this time. Let's do the credits. The associate producer of No Persinium is Parker Sella. Music for No Persinium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society and Solar, the podcast. Special thanks to Siobhan O'Loughlin for voicing our intro. The No Pro podcast is my fault. I'm Noah Nelson, and until next time, I'll see you at the show.